Okay, well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday. Um, I'm Jay Warmke with solarpvtraining.com. And uh, if you're new to this, uh, what we're doing is uh, we, we walk through some of the latest headlines in the news uh, within the solar industry. And then I do uh, just an update of upcoming conferences, webinars, and the like, just to keep everybody informed as to uh, what's happening. Uh, it's kind of an informal chat. We've got folks online, uh, so I invite you guys to jump in if there are questions or additions as we go forward. And then today we're going to have a guest uh, joining us in our deep dive topic here. It's uh, Tristan Rader, and Tristan is the uh, director, the Ohio director of Solar United Neighbors. Going to talk about Solar for All. It's a new program, so I won't get too deep into what that is. I'm writing it down here just so I don't forget it. And uh, okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the headlines here for the week of April 28th. All right, so uh, speaking of uh, solar for all, uh, the Biden administration announced this week $7 billion is going to be um, awarded for the EPA solar for all program. This is part of a, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act where there was $27 billion allocated for greenhouse gas reduction. Um, the money is focused specifically on uh, low-income and disadvantaged households. They're hoping to, and I'm probably stealing all of Tristan's presentation here, but they're hoping to uh, install solar on about 90, uh, 900,000 households, and they're claiming this is going to generate about 200,000 uh, residential jobs uh, in solar, in the solar industry. We'll have to wonder where all those folks are going to come from. We've talked about that before as as did the need for all of these solar installers. A coalition of solar panel manufacturers has filed some anti-dumping petition this week with the U.S. International Trade Commission, as well as with the U.S. Department of Commerce. They've cited illegal trade practices from panels that are being imported from four Southeast Asian nations. That's Cambodia, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand. About a year ago, the U.S. Commerce Department ruled that Chinese panel manufacturers were trying to circumvent tariff restrictions by funneling these panels through those four nations to uh, export them into the United States. But the Biden administration basically said, all right, let's put a two-year moratorium on these tariffs because 80, 84 percent of all of the panels imported in the U.S. are from those countries. So there was concern the industry would be devastated because there would be basically it would increase the price of panels by at least 25 percent. So um, now what's happening is the domestic manufacturers are coming back and saying, listen, this moratorium has allowed the Chinese industry to to build up during this pause, uh, not only within uh, globally, but within the world, within the United States. Uh, and they cite the fact that Oh, in last year, about five gigawatts more panels. Oh, I jumped ahead. More panels were introduced or were imported into the U.S. than were installed. So they're showing that there's about an 18-month inventory of these low-cost imported panels here in the U.S. today, in anticipation of the tariffs being um, put back into force. So they filed a petition hoping to uh, get rid of that moratorium. Uh, venture capital is always known for the, uh, chasing the latest shiny object, but apparently that's no longer solar. Um, a, a year ago, in, in, quarter, in the first quarter of 2023, $2.1 billion in venture capital was uh, channeled into the solar industry. The first quarter of this year, that's dropped 80%, so only about $400 million has been channeled in. Uh, the investors cite uncertainty of interest rates, uh, the fact that there may be additional tariffs coming in on Chinese panels, and also a big concern is with the presidential election. There's a concern that there'll be a change in administration, and that will, of course, change all of the incentives and all of the policies around solar. Uh, this drop in funding has occurred at the same time when there's record growth within the solar industry. Uh, in large measure brought on by the Inflation Reduction Act. 
Uh, batteries are becoming an increasingly important component within uh, the transportation industry with the advent of electric vehicles, but also as a component within the generation on the grid. Uh, a report issued uh, this week by the International Energy Administration uh, says that uh, installed capacity of battery backup on the grid is more than doubled in 2023. EV batteries grew about 40% with about 14 million electric vehicles sold worldwide during 2023. Uh, prices for lithium ion batteries have fallen about 90% since 2010. Uh, in 2010, they cost about $1,400 per kilowatt hour of capacity. Uh, in 2023, it was down to about $140 per kilowatt hour. They're projecting that it's going to fall a further 40% by 2030. Now, that's significant because if it does, then battery storage on the grid will actually be cheaper than uh, natural gas peaker uh, power plants, which are currently used like when you have demand rise, they turn on these peaker power plants uh, to subsidize that increased demand. Um, batteries will take that, will take the place and they will actually be cheaper than the natural gas. Uh, also, they say that if this price decline continues, solar plus storage will probably be the cheapest form of energy for new energy systems that are put onto the grid. And solar surpassed uh, uh, coal for the first time in the great state of Texas. Uh, according to ERCOT, which is the uh, regulatory uh, com commission there in Texas for the Texas grid, coal share fell to about 9% of the grid uh, generating source there in Texas and solar rose to about 10%. Now this is significant because only five or six years ago, in 2017, solar represented only 0.6% of the generating capacity uh, on the Texas grid. And ERCOT is saying that by the end of this year, they anticipate solar will grow an additional 30% within the state. And that's the news from the solar industry for this week. Does anybody have anything uh, to add uh, that's come across your desk? Anybody here online who wants to jump in and throw in or have a question on those things. Feel free as I jump into the next section here on our announcements. Um, okay, so I've increased the size here. Um, let's see, today, today at 2 p.m., how utilities can successfully scale digital twins programs, with basically what this is, virtual, virtual modeling. Um, so, so if you're interested in that, they create a virtual model of the grid and then see how different factors impact it. Um, also, April 30th, today, 7 p.m., um, Maria, 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 Mid Atlantic uh, Renewable Energy Association is going to have a session on battery technologies and how it impacts your everyday life. Then uh, there's going to be a session on May 1st about Unirac systems. This is sponsored by XL Solar. So that's available to you. That's at noon. Um, all of these uh, times are Eastern time. And uh, you, can, you can find these things now that you're aware of them with this great app called Google. I won't give you all of the things. Um, May 1st, new tariffs uh, on solar panels. This is coming from CEF. And that's going to be at 2 p.m. Uh, there's the Midwest Sustainability Summit in Cincinnati, May 2nd. If that's a in-person conference, there's another conference here, AI for Renewable Energy. That's May 6th through the 9th. That's going to be in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, Evervolt Systems, this is a webinar again. Um, this is going to be at 2 p.m. on May 9th from Solar Builder. Restoring failed panels. I found this one kind of interesting. They're basically saying, how can you take panels that are, are damaged or, or not performing up to their optimum and how could they be reconditioned uh, and reinstalled? So I'm, I'm curious about that. I'm gonna take a look at that. Um, May 16th, selling solar in 2024, that's at 2 p.m. And IREC is having uh, one of their things about growing the solar uh, or green workforce. That's on May 16th at uh, 2 p.m. also. And then the ACES conference is coming up. And since ACES is our sponsor here, we should uh, 
plug this. That's going to be May 20th through the 23rd at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. So uh, show up. I'm going to be there. We'll all go watch the college campus protests and things like that. That'll be fun. It'll remind me of when I was in college. That'll, that'll be fun. Hopefully they won't shoot tear gas at me. Um, then June 5th through the 6th, virtual uh, solar conference put on by Aurora Solar. Um, so that would be the 5th of June, and then the 12th through the 15th, Solar and Storage Summit in San Francisco. Um, then there's another one, uh, Renewable Energy or RE Plus Mid-Atlantic in Philadelphia, July 18th through the 19th. A lot of conferences coming up. And I thought I'd highlight this white paper. I thought this might be something that you're interested in. Solar Builder has this white paper available on ways to maximize uh, home battery investments. A lot of folks are considering that. And then, of course, our solarpvtraining.com. We have our online courses and in-person courses. And uh, you're welcome to jump into that website and check those out. So that is all of the events and the like that I ran across. Anybody have anything or problems or issues that have come up in your day-to-day -day solar life here uh, that you want to bring up before we jump into our, our guest and our topic for the for the day, Let's see if I've got. Give you just a second. Everybody's being shy today. All right. So um, that uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Tristan Tristan um, Rader. And Tristan Rader is the Ohio director of the Solar United Neighbors program. And if you're not familiar with Solar United Neighbors or Sun. Um, this will be a good opportunity to get familiar with it. So uh, welcome aboard, uh, Tristan. Good to be here. Thanks for um, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, Tristan, why don't you go ahead and tell us just a little bit about yourself and uh, um, what Solar United Neighbors is before we jump into the topic du, du jour. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Solar United Neighbors is a nonprofit. We're actually based in D.C., Washington, Washington D.C. We've been around since 2009, and we're best known for our solar co-ops, uh, which are buyers clubs, essentially, for rooftop solar, primarily for residential solar. We really believe in this idea that distributed energy, particularly distributed rooftop solar or small ground mount arrays, at the source where you're going to be using them is really the, the cornerstone to the, the energy future. Um, and so we've invested a lot of time, a lot of resources into educating people across the country and advocating for bills and for programs like Solar for All and Community Solar, which we'll be talking about today, that makes that um, a reality. So more people can go solar, regardless of income, regardless of location, and uh, generate their own energy at home. That's our goal. Well, I, I, w I went to a couple of your sessions, I think, early uh, early on, I guess, in the life um and and as I understand it, I don't know if you've morphed the the model, but basically you identify a community. You say, okay, we want to see a group of people come together to install solar. We're going to um, combine our purchasing power and uh, try and put this thing out to bid. We'll evaluate the bids from various contractors, and then rather than you negotiate individually with each of these contractors. Solar United Neighbors is going to say, hey, we're going to give you 50 installs if you give us a great price. Um, and, and that way, the homeowners who are probably very confused about this process anyway are saying, OK, at least there's an adult in the room who's looking over my shoulder and hopefully getting me the best deal that I could realistically expect to get. And and that is and then you guys take a small fee um, as as part of this process. Is that still the model? Yes, um, it's that's exactly right. You did a great job summarizing it. That, that's exactly that. And we find that folks really appreciate that kind of safety is in numbers going to solar together. And it creates community too. Um, and then the, the the next iteration, which I talked a little bit about, was taking those groups of folks that are really excited about solar. They went solar and keeping them together, kind of keeping the, keeping the crew together uh, and using um, that organization of individuals that are excited about solar and then advocating for better solar policies or to protect, protect net metering or whatever's going on in any particular state. So, but that's, that, that's exactly right. That's exactly what the co-op is. Okay, great. And do you know uh, any numbers that you guys have? Yeah, I mean, everybody likes to brag about how many installs have happened uh, because of this. Yeah. 
Uh, we're over 5,000, 5, 6,000 installations uh, in 15 different states. Um, we've got a, we landed a pretty big grant in Puerto Rico. We're helping the Puerto Rican government with a billion dollar investment from the federal government to do a uh, rebuild out of their grid using solar as a cornerstone. So we're really staffing up in those parts of the country. Um, and yeah, it, it, we're, we're all the way stretched from uh, Arizona to, to New England, pretty much. And, uh, you, you know, the number we're really like pushing for right now, we're most proud of because we know that um, in order to accomplish these big, big goals the Biden administration has to put solar on 30 million rooftops and to accomplish their Justice 40 initiative, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, uh, it's going to take a lot of effort across a lot of places. And right now we've got over right now a million people that we've engaged over all of our different lists, working with installers, working in all the different states we're in. So there's literally a million people that we're connected with. Um, who we're trying to communicate with to get involved and either go solar if they have already gone solar, then to continue to fight for energy rights in those places. Okay, terrific. So why don't you jump in and talk a little bit sure. about, I know we had the solar for all, and then I know Ohio's got a community solar initiative thing going on. So uh, yeah, and uh, like, like you mentioned at the top, Jay, I appreciate it. If anybody has questions at all, like put it in the chat or just start talking. I, I love this idea of choose your own adventure style of uh, of giving presentations. So i uh, love to be where you're at. Um, but really, there's two things we'll talk about today. First is solar for all. The second thing is going to be the uh, community solar initiative here in Ohio. That's a statewide bill that's currently in the House of Representatives. But solar for all, as Jade mentioned earlier on, had uh, just been announced on last Monday, not yesterday, but the week before, by the administration announced $7 billion of awards uh, through solar for all. Really exciting. Uh, what that means is um, there's actually uh, awards would be given to uh, a number of different entities, actually 60 different entities across the country. And the whole goal of this is to increase access to affordable, resilient, reliable, clean energy uh, in every corner of the country for particularly lower income individuals. The, the Biden administration originally came out with this idea of Justice 40, meaning that 40 percent of all the benefits of this transition to, to renewable energy uh, should go to disadvantaged communities, frontline communities, communities that are bearing the highest cost for climate change. Um, and they have definitions for that. They've actually targeted a lot of uh, census tracts, which were called energy opportunity census tracts, energy opportunity areas where uh, these investments should happen. Um, and so this $7 billion is, again, part of that $27 billion greenhouse gas reduction fund. Uh, is the It's actually the third of the three categories. The first two categories were uh, different amounts of money. I think the first one was $14 billion, and the second one, second one was $6 billion, mostly to fund and, and create green banks and technical assistance programs for, for uh, financial institutions to increase private capital leverage for what we're trying to do here. And that's making sure that you know both market rate solar and uh, affordable solar, solar that's targeted at an affordable level, uh, of folks uh, is accessible and that these institutions, you know, will use their resources and some of this federal resources uh, towards making um, solar, particularly rooftop solar in a lot of these cases, uh, available to 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 all people. Um, and this particular program- okay, seven Before you jump on, I've got a question there from Please. Pete. Um, Pete, uh, let me, we'll do the gorilla uh, conversation here. So Please, please. Pete, you had a question on that? Yeah, it's, real, it's an observation. Tristan has said, he wants to um, provide solar regardless of location, and he said all states. Now, remember, 15 of the U.S. states have no net metering, so I'm hoping right. the discussion will clarify how we do this in the states that have no net metering. I have yeah, no, that's a great, okay. that's a great point, uh, and this is why we also need to be fighting for better energy policy in those places. We operate in, you know, Arizona and Indiana and other places that don't have net metering, so uh, you know, really. One thing that we've pushed for hard with Solar for All, uh, I could even back it up a little bit higher level too. Um, we've run these um, low-income solar pilot programs around the country. We did one in Columbus, one in Cleveland, based on one we did in uh, Indianapolis, which is actually based on one called Solar for All. Back in the 2011 to 2012, we created a program called Solar for All for the city of uh, Washington, D.C. That, that really aimed to give away solar, right? We're going to give away solar. We're going to see uh, try to identify the barriers to to why people don't go solar. Uh, and, and what we found is building trust is one of the biggest barriers to uh, solar in communities that um, historically haven't, uh, and there is no solar and up to this point in many of these communities. Um, but really, you know, the, to answer your question about net metering, um, I, 
there's another part of this equation, and, and you'll see that here, types of solar, community solar, uh, something we're pushing for in a lot of these states that currently don't have community solar, like Ohio, is to adopt legislation that can allow for more individuals to access solar. We don't find the net metering portion to be particularly, uh, of course, it reduces the benefit. It makes it more expensive to add the solar on in the beginning, and that payout period, the payback period is, is much longer. But if you're able to fund it and figure out ways to get solar on roofs, it will reduce people's energy burden, uh, even without net metering. Um, and I think batteries, too, are going to be a big, big step towards uh, those solutions in those places that don't have net metering. But really, you still have individuals that don't can't put solar on their roof at all. You have people that are renters or have roofs that are very old or structures that won't support solar. So um, community solar is really the only other option for a vast majority of people that are at or below that 200 percent of poverty, which is the, the limit for a community solar or live in those energy opportunity corridors. If you're in Cleveland like I am. Um, all of Cleveland census tracts basically are energy opportunity corridors based on um, the income of Cleveland. So, and essentially anyone in Cleveland should be able to qualify for, for these, these programs. So it, all that to say, it's going to be a mix. And how this program worked really was it's, it, it didn't just have a one size fits all solution. It asked for 60, uh, app, or it was going to award 60 applicants. It asked for uh, any number of applicants that could be states, municipalities, counties, tribes, nonprofits, groups of nonprofits, to come up with the best ideas that fit their loca locations. To achieve those goals, which you can see here, which is reducing folks' energy burden by 20%, reducing the cost of electricity generated through solar by at least 20%. So that credit for the portion of energy they're receiving from these projects will be 20% cheaper than the solar they're receiving or energy that they're receiving from the grid before that. It's a pretty big number, actually. Um, and there's a there's a lot of ways to do it, um, but you know places that have net metering are obviously going to get to that twenty percent easier. But there's still other mechanisms that we can use, like batteries, like I said, to get to the twenty percent in other places, uh, and mixing in a lot of community solar too, where um, you know uh, economies of scale. When you're paying a dollar fifty per watt installed, you can obviously get a lot more benefit out of that rather than paying two fifty three dollars per watt to put a, an array on a on a roof. Uh, single away on roof. So mixing these two things is a good way to uh, get to those um, general numbers, 20% reduction. Uh, again, pretty big program, four, gig, four gigawatts of solar, 900,000 households. I think we mentioned that. The, the government's aiming for $350 million of electricity bill savings uh, over the course of the the pro, uh, per year, actually, uh, which is pretty cool. So any, any questions on that? Hopefully I answered your question okay. Yeah, I think that I just saw one in the chat pop up about east west orientation as opposed to you know southern. Mm -hmm. um, I I I don't know if there's any restrictions there. I can't imagine there would be. Um, but there was another one that that popped into my mind. Um, is there? Do you anticipate? And this is just looking at your crystal ball. Uh, any opposition from the utilities because they've been throwing a lot of. Uh, roadblocks into the adoption. And here's a big program that's going to take a, a fairly large chunk of their of their customer base in theory out of there. Um, yeah. Are they involved in this at all? Or are they opposing yes, it? Yes, in some places they are. I think, again, it, it really depends on where you are. Um, obviously, states that have uh, better net metering and uh, requirements for the utilities to interconnect projects are going to be a step ahead. Uh, I, do we, do we have... Already, we've been in talks with Cleveland Public Power, and we actually helped shape a Columbus Public Utilities um, net metering statute in preparation for this. So you have these more progressive, smaller utilities reacting in a very positive way, we found, because um, they're excited. They're excited about this opportunity, um, as states and municipalities are eligible for this money, to potentially build their own projects and, and help their residents reduce their costs. It's a, it's a very positive thing for them. We haven't heard too much from the utilities here in Ohio, though I have heard that there are utilities in other states who um, are, are currently being talked to. I think one of the one of the benefits, though, is the fact that a lot of states, uh, at least 50 states, are parts of or have applied on their own for these applications. And states do have a lot of control at the end of the day what utilities can and can't do. So I think as long as states like Ohio was awarded, the state of Ohio was awarded 100, I'll go to the next slide, was awarded $156 million. Um, you know, having the, the state actively involved in the program uh, and also in charge of uh, how the utilities at the end of the day are regulated, uh, certainly I think will lead to some conversations that should be productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah, had uh, our, our last session, I think we talked about, is it time to discuss whether the utilities should be nationalized? You know, if, if you've got a system that's 
not proving itself, you know, during crisis. Um, you know, I think at least in my mind, we came to the decision of maybe, maybe that would be worse, but at least it's a discussion we should have. Yeah, um, I think it's fascinating. I wish, I'm sorry, I missed it. That's a conversation <laughs> I, I'm always having with my friends. Yeah, there's pros and cons. I mean, you look at the Tennessee Valley Authority, there's other entities that are doing very well for themselves, um, but also have challenges that are that the IOUs don't, investor-owned utilities don't. So, Well, do you um, know if this solar for all will allow for community solar or is it only rooftop, uh, individual home rooftop solar that it's targeting? Yeah, and that was my next point here. So you're you're right on you're right on cue. Thanks, Jay. Uh, both you know these programs are going to be really meant to and the emphasized in the notice of opportunity to apply for these grants that they really were looking for um, these grants to leverage private capital and also um, they can be applied to and they were really emphasizing that and not just be rooftop solar and not just community solar but a mix of both. So yes, this money is can go towards developing community solar projects um, as well as uh, go directly towards loans, grants, any kind of mix of financial tools that get to that 20% savings for rooftop solar as well. Um, so uh, pretty exciting opportunity. And we're really excited that the application that I was most involved with, and I did part of the budget for, we did the, basically the program design for at Sun was the Growth Opportunity Partners Heartland application, which is stretched out over 30 communities, eight states, um, and really, really big application, lots of coordinating with a lot of different entities. And we were able to, we were successful. So it's $156 million that we'll be targeting towards uh, urban populations, mostly inner city uh, populations from Kansas City to Buffalo to Cleveland, you know, uh, cities in West Virginia, Indiana, Pennsylvania. It'll uh, it'll be fun to kind of start to get to uh, really break that down. And and we're still waiting to hear from the EPA. They had a, they had a webinar yesterday with some next steps, but there's going to be a lot of paperwork um, and things that have to happen between then and now while we get these programs um, started. And we'll have a whole year to set them up and another four years to uh, actually uh, execute the program and spend the money, essentially. So, so is this targeted exclusively on residential? And and I guess my second question on that is, um, is this just a flat out grant where somebody's going to come in and put this thing and pay for 100%? Or is it subsidizing, say, yeah. 50% like the REAP grants? Um, how does that work? Every program is going to be able to have some uh, flexibility in how they administrate it. Uh, but essentially, the federal government is cutting a $156, $156 million check to Growth Opportunity Partners and another 156 to OAQDA to, to administrate those programs. And so I'll give you an example. I did the budget for Cleveland that became the model for some of the other cities in our um in our 30, 30 community wide application. Um, and I'd put in for about 17 million for the county, Cuyahoga County, which was split about eight and nine ish uh, for 8 million for community solar and 9 million for rooftop solar. Um, and, and through a, a variety of mechanisms, um, a lot of those, a lot of the money that we we put forward in Cleveland, Cleveland is a you know historically uh, economically disadvantaged community. Um, a lot of that will be 100% grants. Uh, and then there's going to be a lot of mixed um, financial products, super low interest rate loans, uh, bridge loans, uh, other types of um, very low cost loans to help leverage some of the capital that Growth Opportunity Partners is getting through the other two uh, other two buckets of money um, that, that the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is providing. So it's a mix. Um, and it's certainly that money, that 156 is certainly going to, going to be a lot of community solar projects and it's going to be, um, a lot of rooftop solar projects. Have they given you an indication of when this money is going to come? Because Soon. sometimes these government programs, obviously this is part of the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed in August of 2022. Yeah. And they're just getting this money kind of rolling out here. Yeah, government doesn't work fast. Turnaround for this application was pretty quick. Um, and they want to, I'm hearing July is when the first payment and September close to that will be the second payment. Um, as you can imagine with um, what's happening this year, 2024 election year, uh, they want this money out the door and pretty much in the bank accounts of all these organizations by the end of September, I think is what the what the goal is. I, I had a quick question um, uh, following up on uh, Jay's comment about uh, about the cost of the installations, uh, when you say uh, there's a there's the goal is a a twenty percent reduction in the electricity cost, 
does that assume from the point of view of the uh, of the consumer uh, that the uh, that the solar system is free for them, or does it include some kind of financial commitment to pay for it long term? Yeah, it, it's it's literally a mix of those things. And um, there were other applications that did not do any types of like free solar. They didn't. They didn't. Uh, but when you're working, when you're working with folks, we've learned through our pilot programs. When you're working for, with folks that are at 200 percent of poverty. Even though we may be able to achieve 20 percent savings by um, putting a lot of this money into low interest rate loans um, and doing more solar across the board, we just know that folks at that poverty level or below 200 percent or below still will not be able to afford or will move forward think, thinking that they're going to have to pay something. So we we made a, a significant a portion of this uh, purely 100 percent grant uh, based. We are using some mechanisms to try to leverage the ITC investment tax credit. So there's some ways we're trying to recoup some of that so we can reinvest it into the program through some of the direct pay options, nonprofit. Um, you know, nonprofits are allowed now to receive the ITC 30% tax credit on all inst solar installations. So, you know, we're using some financial models and I think all of that's getting built right now, essentially over the next 10 months. Uh, from now, uh, we'll have a lot of this uh, to announce and roll out. But it's going to, again, it's going to be a mix of that low income, 100% grant solar, all the way up to, you know, bridge loans or folks uh, who who are eligible for the tax credit and uh, just need a little bit of help to buy that solar array in order to get them over the hump. And then we can go and show that, you know, all of that equaled 20% across the board savings for all the participants in our program. Yeah, one of the things, what a, uh, a project that I've been involved with, and I wonder if it's part of this program, putting putting solar on low-income housing, there were a few items that we identified in some of the planning that maybe go over onto all of these other projects as well, like uh, the tax credits, right? If you're yep. a low-income person, there's no real need for those tax credits typically. So is there a way of basically retaining ownership of these systems, but then providing the, the power to those folks. The other issue was um, most of these systems now rely on Wi-Fi um, for reporting and, and mechanisms that may or may not be available in those low-income areas. We're dealing in rural applications. So yep. cellular service, Wi-Fi availability, all of these kind of things are things we have to kind of work around with our systems to figure out what's the, what's the best way what, what's the best system to install? And then is there a concern if you just simply turn these things over that they don't just turn around and sell them? You know, I mean, it's like, hey, for, uh, lower cost electricity is great, but I can get five grand for this $10,000 yeah. system. And, uh, you know, that's money in my pocket right now. Sure. And I think you hit the nail on the head with the, and this is something we built into our, our pilot. But this is something you learn and why you do pilots, right? Um, it's something you learn because you're working in Appalachia, you're working with the same communities we've been working with for, through our pilots in urban areas. Uh, yeah, we, when we go to spec this and run the RFPs to do the solar, we include O&M, much, much better O&M, uh, high level warranties. So we go ahead and opt for the extensions and all the warranties we can for all the equipment. And we automatically include um, modems because we know that Wi-Fi is not going to be. So once we're, we're issuing the RFPs with all of this stuff in mind, like it's the bell, all the bells and whistles, essentially. Squirrel guards, everything to, everything. So that's, that array has the best chance of making it 30 years without us touching it, right? Um, and and also we make sure that we have access to that data too so that we can get track sort of how the program is doing in case the government wants to check up on it, right? Um, and then there's a little bit of trust too. I think building trust goes both ways. Building trust with the community to be able to um, do this in the first place, to get them to the finish line, to install the array. And also trusting that, you know, if they've gone through this process and, and they really believe in it and they're seeing the savings that they're going to keep that array on their roof, I think is part of it. So I don't see, unless you're doing some type of like uh, you mentioned, um, maybe a nonprofit owning the system for five years while we recoup the tax benefit and then, you know, either selling it or giving it to them at no cost after that five-year period. Um, you know, having some paperwork that means they can't mess with it in that time frame, but really just trusting that they keep it on their roof and uh, at least allowing us access to the data so we can keep track of it. I think I interrupted somebody who had a question. Um, give you guys an opportunity there. Oh, apparently put, not. Oh, yeah. I go put ahead. mine in the chat. <laughs> oh, okay. Why don't you bring it up, Nick? Yeah, sure, go ahead and read yeah. it or say it. <clears throat> 
Yeah, I was just wondering about, you know, like low income rentals and mm -hmm. that are operated even through, um, you know, public housing entities. I mean, is there an ins any incentives or grants available to the housing authorities? I yeah. I've been unable to surface them. Sure. Uh, I, th I do believe that our application, um, the Growth Opportunity Partners application, um, CMHA is a partner and they're excited about um, potentially um, getting a chunk of this money to do some uh, installations on their new housing development in the Wood Woodhill area. So they are part of this specific application. Um, and I know they're searching for other opportunities too. And we haven't connected. And we'll probably have to connect really soon on this once we start getting it moving to um, you know, there's a lot of steps in the process to move forward with these projects, but um, I know I do know there are housing authorities that would absolutely qualify um, and are excited to hopefully move forward. And it's a different consideration too. They usually in how they do their metering is, is sometimes a little bit different. Um, and because they're already receiving subsidies from the federal government, there's like more paperwork essentially to figuring yeah. it out. We believe that they're qualified and and they're part of this application. And the application was approved, so uh, so far things are are moving forward. Okay. Yeah. I proposed a microgrid for the community that I'm working in. And they great have idea. great solar stuff. And the apartments are individually metered, but um, you know, they if they went through a microgrid, then they could take the benefit of the solar for the residents. But the housing authority just, it was too hard to navigate. <laughs> yeah. So for them to be able to, you know, uh, get the you know, if we can save for, for doing it, <clears throat> if we can save HUD costs or we can save like very low income individuals costs that that's more money and they can house more people with, you know, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great initiative or a great way to think about it. Jay, Tristan. Yeah, go ahead, Ted. Yes. Uh, two, two questions un unrelated. Uh, one is, um, does this program include any off-grid rural and it, it really it would be uh, those who are uh, i mean i'm i'm very rural um i have my own off-grid solar system uh that that'll eventually have to probably get upgraded however you know i'm not the only one like that so we're not on you know there are there are rural community rural homeowners that are off-grid uh, does this program can they apply for this too does it include them but the second question is inside some city areas, localities, where uh, there are historical commission requirements. Uh, uh, obviously, a community solar would be better, but, you know, do have you encountered uh, working with those and, and how do you, um, um, you know, address those kind of historical uh, building concerns? Yeah, so on the rural question, the off-grid question, non-grid tied situation, um, at least with the uh, the growth opportunity partners application I worked on, we didn't really, I factored in batteries. There's a certain number of batteries for energy insecure neighborhoods, essentially. So if we determine that a neighborhood uh, power goes out a lot, we, they may be also be eligible for a battery. We did apply for 250 million and we only got 156. So I'm guessing the batteries will probably be one of the first things in the chopping block since we have net metering and batteries do not necessarily equate to savings and savings is what we're going for. But I would think that OEQDA's application being charged to help the whole state, we're really just focusing in, on, in urban areas and OEQDA is is really doing a program statewide. Um, to, to You could look at these two programs as complementing each other. Um, I would imagine they're the ones, and I'm not super involved. We're a partner on that application. We advised a little bit on it, but I don't, I'm not aware of like the inner workings of what they're doing for rural folks. I think it'd be smart, especially in Appalachia, where you have the highest density of energy burden in the state, believe it or not, in some of those counties down south. It'd be really smart for them to do that. So I'm hoping they do. Was there so, another question in there? What was the second question? Working with historical uh, commissions oh, yeah. in, in, in those cities. Yeah, so that's something that we're we've always done. Something like we're currently doing in Columbus. I've I've submitted several letters to several different historic districts. We've been successful in some, uh, and what I think that really comes down to making sure the city, like the cities, all have these really high lofty goals with renewable energy. A lot of rooftops are usually baked baked in there. So many gigawatts reducing carbon, all that, or megawatts, whatever it is. So getting them to connect with their area commissions or whoever the boards are. So the city is talking to itself 
uh, and, and able to break down those barriers and, and make sure they're implementing the climate action plan has been our like secret sauce or we've had success at that. In Cleveland, it's getting the sustainability department to talk to the um, the boards and the individual wards that control some of that zoning uh, and getting them all to talk to the uh, Cleveland public power, you know, getting everybody to talk to each other so that we can get these projects done. I found that once sort of like the mayor's office is clued in or copied on things, things start to move a little bit faster. And I don't know how it would work in more rural areas. The good thing about these applications are most cities, at least, uh, have signed on to most of these applications so that they're at least eligible for funding and should be very excited to help um, streamline some of those permitting processes. Well, I would say that uh, in the rural areas that I deal with, I've run into politically charged discussions already yeah. around solar and electric vehicles specifically. So, you know, that's going to be something we've got to navigate through because the politicians may be saying, yeah, this is all good, but but I'm getting a lot of pushback every time I mention the word solar. So yeah. that's that's something we're going to have to just kind of kind of navigate. Yeah, I think this is a good like a tipping point, and I think this is a good like nudge. Um, I mean, I don't know if we're going to have enough time, Jay, to talk about the community solar bill, but you know, there's a community solar bill in our state, and we're already using this as a as a uh, a carrot. Like, hey, here's all this investment, state. Um, please allow community solar. Because right now in Ohio, we don't have a community solar statute, right? So um, some states do, some don't. 22 states do, the rest don't. Um, and in order to really leverage uh, this program, which will leverage private dollars alongside the federal dollars, um, we need legislation, just like at the local rural level, we need legislation at the state level to do these community solar projects to really make all of this sing to make it uh, go as, as far as it possibly can and help as many people as it can. But Well, why don't we jump into that? Because uh, just sure. as a little background for folks who aren't familiar with community solar, basically this is the concept where if your home for whatever reason is not suitable to have a private system, you can purchase into a larger system and then allocate that production to your home. The stumbling block there is that the utilities are often not all that excited about um, you know doing the paperwork that's involved with saying okay we've got this big system now we're going to allocate 400 different bills from this system and in the states where it's worked like Minnesota specifically you know they just say listen utility you want to do business in our state you will do this and and where they mandate it 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 becomes a very effective uh, way of getting solar out there to the masses. So. Yeah, good, 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 great description, Jay. I think it's exactly right. And that's kind of what we have here. When we're talking about community solar, there's a lot of definitions. Um, and we're, this is specifically, especially in this Ohio pilot program that's currently drafted and it's um, it's it's in session, it's uh, in committee hearings right now. Uh, we're talking about those one to 100 acre sized, uh, up to 20, uh, 20 megawatts, but generally speaking, much smaller than that, uh, solar arrays. There's grid tide, which is transmission level, and you know you have your microgrid slash behind the meter or rooftop solar, which is an acre or less, mostly found on roofs, small fields behind a business or something like that. Just so, so, so community solar is, is at the distribution level. It's connected to the grid, and the source of that energy uh, essentially is, is being you know the, the energy generated anywhere is going to go to the nearest load, right? So the energy is being used wherever it's being generated. However, folks in the community will be able to subscribe to that array and receive mm -hmm. a credit. Um, which is great. The bill credit is um, also how this bill's written would be a guaranteed savings, a little bit less than whatever the standard uh, service offer is. So, um, and this is another just example when you when you subscribe to Community Solar, you're essentially signing up to receive your solar from these specific panels any given time. So you're going to get a credit depending on the time of year, um, based on how much energy that that particular array is uh, is generating. So does that make sense? Or are there there's other definitions out there, but this is specifically what we're talking about. Right. Well, I know that Ohio's got a pilot project going on in theory right now, right? Uh, isn't that for the brownfields and things like that? Yeah. So right now, um, if you're in Ohio, the only places you can do community solar legally today would be municipal utilities that have allowed it and the rural electric co-ops, the RECs, rural electric co-ops that, that do have community solar projects. Um, if you're anywhere else, if you're in that investor-owned utility territory, 
Um, so if you're a First Energy Duke AEP customer, you can't have solar, even, even on brownfields or anything like that. This bill, HB 197, would allow for uh, 1,000 megawatts mm -hmm. of solar to be developed on any site in any, any utility territory. Uh, and then another 500 would be allocated specifically to brownfield sites. Um, and as it stands right now, um, they would all sort of be rated um, at the same amount. So you'd receive a little bit of savings over what you're paying now for your for your uh, for your energy, just how they structured the right structure in the bill. Uh, above my pay grade, that somebody at the PUC or lawyer could explain to you. I sat through the cost benefits analysis seminars on this, and uh, it, it's pretty complicated how they how they got to the numbers. But um, essentially, you're you you know you're moving a fuel cost, and these these arrays and these developers um, are getting uh, paid by the utilities uh, for the utility the energy they generate, and the utilities are going and, and selling that energy to the customers, and and that's and, and that difference between what we pay from other fuel sourced energies like gas and, and anything else in, in the general mix, the standard service mix, um, solar is gonna come out to be a few cents cheaper than than what's currently uh, offered. So uh, these projects are gonna be capped at for the brownfields, 10 megawatts, and then 20 megawatts for the other, other sites. You're gonna see some at that level, but I think the vast majority are gonna be at five megawatts or below. You're also gonna see a lot of arrays that are smaller, municipally owned arrays, uh, community cooperative owned arrays, um, which is like truly community owned community solar. I think you'll see some folks, any number of groups can own these community solar projects, except for the utilities. Utilities are not allowed to own generation in the state. Um, but, but maybe they'll figure out a way, you know, who knows, but right now it's only, um, nonprofits, for profits, community groups, places like that municipalities, government agencies that can own those solar arrays. And there's again, a, a guaranteed savings component that keeps the rate a little bit below other types of generation or the mix. Has, has, any, has anyone in the state of Ohio explained why we had to have a, a test project when this has been tested and proved effective in, in multiple other states? I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's so, I'll, oh, I should add to politically, I think I have a slide in here. Oh yeah. So this is the savings that'll be generated uh, through this uh, Ohio University to study. Uh, pretty, pretty big savings, a pretty big job creator in the state, right? Um, and, and a pretty good adder to our gross domestic, but domestic product. Um, but we had a hearing, um, so this is representative Ray. She's the Republican leadership, um, in our state house. And she's the lead sponsor of this bill. This bill is a Republican bill, <laughs> uh, which it needs to be because that's our legislature right now. It's a two thirds Republican. Um, and, and we, you know, it, we need folks from both sides of the aisle. So this is actually now a bipartisan bill and, and in order to get it over the finish line, there, there has to be some concessions. And some of the, one of those concessions is it's a, it's a restricted pilot type program. Um, and it's, it just has to be that way for now. And once we've sort of proven that concept, we know like other places, Minnesota, um, Maryland, that, that, you know, it, it could be made easily made permanent after the pilot. Interesting. Can you speak to uh, two things? One is, it, um, if a community is interested and they've not, this is they just hear about it. What's their first step? Who do they approach? And the second question is, you know, on, on that slide about the the, the Republican representation, yeah. what's the underlying fundamental um, um, res resistance? Now, Jay has talked about utilities don't really yeah. want to give up, you know, inertia. But that's right. If you had to, where where would you start in trying to at least uh, address the resistance? Yeah, it's the utilities. You know, and they're very, very, very powerful in this state. They give a lot of money to a lot of politicians. I'm sure you've heard. <laughs> yeah. And you don't get into that. Uh, and and you know they carry a lot of weight. They throw a lot of weight around. Um, and uh, I don't know the, their their math. Uh, you know, is that there's some type of cost shift, uh, meaning that community solar will create some additional costs that then will have to be socialized amongst all the customers. Um, we don't believe that. In fact, there's economic benefits. And now two of them were presented at the last it's April 25th hearing that we were just at, uh, was it April 25th or April 24th? April 24th hearing we were just at, I mistyped it. Uh, if I type this on the 25th, that's why it's on the 25th. But <laughs> we, we uh, uh, you know, th th there are no real costs. Just when you factor in the benefits of solar, the fact that you're putting energy close to the source, you're using it, you're not using the transmission grid at all. 
you're using only the, the distrib distrib distribution utility. The bill itself requires that developers uh, pay all the costs of interconnection. The, the, the utility doesn't come out and give them a free meter like they do for us homeowners. That the costs are 100% on the on the developers of these projects to interconnect uh, and make sure that the lines are upgraded. Everything we need to do to make the project work uh, means there's very little cost shift. And we know the utilities are are, are just afraid of, of of sort of new generation they can't control and they're not going to make money off of essentially. Uh, it it does not necessarily benefit the utilities to do this, so they don't want to do it. Um, though we know it's an overall benefit to the grid, it's an overall benefit to Ohio consumers, right? In fact, the, the two cost benefits analysis sees when you when you do the math comes out to a four cent um, net benefit across all customers because of the fact that again you're using energy that is generated in state uh, and you're creating infrastructure that's paid for not by anybody but the developers themselves who are going to be you know, signing up subscribers who are going to be paying for that energy and they're going to be making money too. Um, but it's just a great way to uh, to do this. And we had a great hearing, right? So we had to pack the room, plenty of people. I mean, you the IE, uh, IBEW from unions to landowners to uh, all kinds of different groups, uh, policy advocacy groups, a lot of the solar developers, of course, and that's regular rank and file folks who want to subscribe to solar energy, our, our members, solar rooftop homeowners that want to uh, get a, get us off carbon and get us to energy independence here in this in this state. So we're seeing really a groundswell in folks supporting this bill. Um, and we had a lot of great media engagement too. So we're seeing it move. And right now, kind of where we're at and where we're going, uh, there'll be another hearing on May 7th. This could be a potential vote hearing. Uh, we know it's coming out of these hearings has been very positive, talking to the speaker and talking to the, the board, the chair of the uh, utilities committee. Uh, there could be a possible vote as early as May 8th on the floor. Uh, of the uh, of the house, which is also my birthday, that'd be a great birthday present for me. I'm trying to tell everybody this is this just do me a solid uh, pass HB one ninety seven. That'd be great. Uh, there, but if we miss the May eighth vote, there there could be an opportunity on May twenty second. Uh, kind of like that's the date we really need to get this done in the house. There is a companion bill, meaning a, a bill that mirrors this bill that was introduced in the Senate, uh, and that's already uh, been assigned to the. Um, uh, uh, the Energy and Utilities Committee. Still waiting to hear on when we're going to have a, uh, a hearing date on that. Another, another, another Republican Lang introduced that as well, which is, again, in Ohio, really important that you have um, uh, Republicans and Democrats at this point working together on something. And this is something that they are working together on. So we're excited about it. Uh, but yeah, the utilities are the, the one group that will never come around. And we know that. And we just have to override them and show them there's more support out here um, for it. So all right. Well, I'm going to be conscious of time here. We've got about yeah. oh, less than five minutes, so uh, or or oh, less. So, do you have anything that uh, you want to summarize there, or anybody have no. a question they want to throw at you? Let's see if we've got any any others out there. It uh, okay. Well, um, then I want to thank you, Tristan, for joining us Great. today, and uh, let everybody know that we'll reconvene again next week at noon. So thanks everybody, and thanks again. Take care. Thank you, guys. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.